Hi guys, please like, share and subscribe and contact this number if you want full lectures of any CM or CS subjects. Thank you. Okay. Hello and welcome guys. In this video, I'll start off with chapter number 9 and 10 of subject CM2 which are basically Brownian motion, stochastic calculus and ITO process. We'll be studying all these uh, together. Okay, chapter 9 basically pertains to binom uh, Brownian motion and chapter 10 pertains to stochastic calculus and ITO process but I'll be taking them all together okay in order to uh, you know have a holistic understanding. The reference for uh, this uh, chapter, these two chapters that we'll be using is the book by John C. Hull that is called as Options, Futures and Other Derivatives. Okay, so I'll be referring to that book a lot. And uh, the other reference that I'll use is the acted CM2 material. Okay, so if you want to, you know, read on your own, these are the books that you have to refer to. Okay, otherwise I'll be covering everything. So mostly there won't be a need, but then you can go through these books if you want. Okay. So let's just first get into the objective of the subject. So the objective of the subject here is to build a model for the stock price movement. Okay. So that will be our objective with these two chapters that will try to model the price of a stock. Okay. And then these models will be later on used in uh, further chapters to build the model for option pricing right, which is the black Scholes option pricing formula. So we'll get there. There's a lot of application of this chapter. But uh, what you need to understand here is right now we are trying to model the price of a stock. So if I check the price of a stock, what does it look like graphically? So if you see the graph of a stock price, I'm taking stock price on the Y axis and taking time on the X axis, obviously, it looks somewhat, somewhat like this. Okay, it's very zigzaggy. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of random movements in it and you can see clearly see that there is a general trend as well. So there are two things here. There are a lot of random movements which are represented as a zigzag here. And then you can see there is a general increasing trend. Now, whenever you want to model the change in a quantity with a particular independent variable here, the independent variable is time and the dependent variable is the stock price. Whenever you are trying to model the change in a variable with another independent quantity, you use calculus to do it. Okay. And the kind of calculus we have been using so far is called as the Newtonian calculus because it was given by Sir Isaac Newton. Okay. To explain his laws of motion, to explain his equations of motion, he had given his Newtonian calculus and that is where it all started. Now, with Newtonian calculus, the point is that you want this curve, the curve that you have to be smooth because it has to be differentiable at each point. When I talk about calculus, it has to be differentiable at each point if I want to mo model it using the Newtonian calculus, right? Now you can model this general trend using the Newtonian calculus, but the challenge here is that this zigzaggy movement, this randomness or as we call it uh, in uh, you know financial terms this volatility in the stock price is very difficult to model this randomness here so we use an alternative kind of calculus which models this volatility or randomness which is called as the stochastic calculus So here we'll be using Newtonian calculus to model the general trend, which is called as the drift. Okay. And we'll be using the stochastic calculus to model the volatility. Now, what is the difference between the two? Let, let's try to understand that drift here represents the general movement, the overall trend in the share price. This may be because of, uh, let's say the general investment returns in the market. Okay. Or uh, you can say it may be because of uh, uh, the inflation in the market. The price of everything along with stocks, along with the residential properties, everything, the commercial properties, gold, everything in the market always grows in general. Okay, as long as uh, the economy is uh, functioning stably, it always grows because investors want investment returns in the long run. 
okay and their money is worth has to increase right so this is that trend okay let's draw it a bit like this so this is that trend that is there this is the drift okay and apart from this drift there is a lot of randomness involved in the stock price which is basically due to pr uh, demand and supply fluctuations so often your stock price deviates from this general trend and that is the volatility which is a measure for the risk because if you'll see this general trend is just representing risk discounted rate of return okay the, these deviations are actually the measure of risk so this volatility this randomness which is introduced here is the representative of risk so we'll be using stochastic calculus to model it so that was my discussion on how what are we exactly going to do here now let's try to construct the mathematical model okay now let's just discuss what you need to know before starting with the ca uh, calculus first thing you need to know is the stochastic processes right stochastic processes were discussed in subject cs2 if you don't remember them or you haven't studied subject cs2 you can go and watch my lecture on uh, stochastic processes that's the first lecture of subject cs2 i've covered it uh, thoroughly there apart from this topic no other topic from uh, cs2 is required for cm2 so even if you have not studied cs2 you can do cm2 there's no problem with that okay so what are stochastic processes stochastic processes are time dependent random phenomena right which are modeled as a set of ordered random variable so again you can see here we are trying to model the share price which is a time dependent random phenomena right it is changing randomly with time right here we take two assumptions the two assumptions are that the state space is continuous and the time set is continuous now uh, there are flaws in these assumptions because exactly your uh, state space is not continuous because uh, uh, share price uh, movements they are only tracked up to the nearest pesa or nearest cent or in uh, if you talk about uk to the nearest pence okay they are tracked only up to a certain uh, unit okay of currency so they cannot be completely continuous but uh, even very small share price movements are tracked so that's why i'm just uh, considering that uh, it can be considered as continuous okay the second one is continuous time set now uh, you only observe the uh, share prices on discrete points of time you do not observe them all the time when the market is closed uh, they are not observed okay so they are only uh, observed during the market uh, hours okay so there is some flaw with this again it is not continuous but we'll assume that uh, the share price is continuous this uh, will make our uh, you know mathematics workable the next thing we are going to assume is the markov property now if you remember what the markov property says markov pro property just says that uh, the future is just dependent on the present and the past is irrelevant in modeling the future okay if i talk about in terms of a share price what does this imply this implies is weak form efficient markets if you haven't uh, done the efficient market hypothesis chapter you can go and refer to my video on that that's also available on youtube okay so uh, that's just a 13 minute video just check that out okay so yeah so marco property just implies uh, weak form efficient markets what does this mean see what i'm telling you is that the past does not matter the present is sufficient to model the future right that's what the markov property says weak form efficient market is one where there is no benefit of using past data okay where your technical analysis becomes useless okay so that just means that the past trends in the data are of the share price are already incorporated in the current price which is exactly what the markov property says so these are two uh, these uh, two imply the same thing so your markov property in case of share price movements implies that the markets are weak form efficient because the past data becomes irrelevant and only the present is relevant right so these were a few things that i had to discuss now let's get into the mathematics okay so let's start off with our model so let's consider a markov process z what does it mean that the past does not matter and the future can be completely modeled based on the present okay let's say this process z has an annual change in value 
with a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance as 1. Okay. That's your distribution for the annual change in the value of Z. Okay. So when the change in time is equal to 1, change in Z has a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1. Right. So that's something you can note. Okay. What will be the two year change? Two year change will have a normal distribution with the parameter 0, 0,1 plus again a normal distribution with parameter 0, 0,1. Right. Bec uh, that's quite obvious because uh, see, uh, this is one year change and this is the next year's change. Right. So you can just add up to get the two year change. Right. So what will be the distribution of that? See normal. How does it get added? We know in case of the normal distribution, the means can be added and the variances can be added directly, right? In order to get, uh, just add the distribution, right? So where, uh, and since they uh, have a Markov property, they both have to be independent of each other, right? Because this past, it cannot affect this future, right? So they have to be independent. And since they are independent, that just means that the uh, Markov property holds and that just means that I can just add their variances. So variance of uh, x plus y or uh, yeah, variance of x plus y will be equal to variance of x plus variance of y and to a uh, covariance term will be zero, right? So it just becomes normal zero comma two distribution. So two year change will have a normal two comma uh, zero comma two distribution, right? If you'll talk about a 0 0.5 year change, Similarly, it will have a normal 0, 0,5, uh, 0, uh, 0, 0, 0.5 distribution, right? Now, if I talk about the change in change in delta t period of time, right, which I can call as z t, okay, uh, change in z, okay, I'll just call it as delta z. So, the change in uh, delta t period of time, which is just delta z, will have a normal distribution with mean 0 and the variance as delta t, right, which is the change in time. As we have seen in the previous cases, the variance was always equal to the change in time, right, for this particular process. So that should be fine by you. I can actually write this as delta z can be written as normal 0, 0,1 distribution into root over delta t, right, you can write it like that. Because see, if you will multiply this uh, root over delta t with uh, this distribution, the mean will still uh, stay zero and the variance will be multiplied with the uh, square of this constant. Okay, so this constant, if it is delta t, the uh, root over delta t, then its square will be delta t, right? So this and this are exactly the same, right? So that is what I've done. And you can finally write it as epsilon into root over delta t where epsilon has a normal distribution with a uh, parameter 0 comma 1 standard normal distribution right you can write your delta z as epsilon times root over delta t okay just remember this let's move on okay now let's say you're modeling over a longer period of time this time i was considering it was a short period of time that was delta t right so now you are modeling over a longer period of time that is capital t so you start off at time uh, 0 and you end up at time capital t at time 0 your uh, stochastic process has uh, the markov process we have been discussing it has a value of z0 and at time t your uh, the process has a value of z t so if you'll see z t minus z0 what is this change if I divide this timeline into let's say n parts, let's say I divide this timeline entire timeline into n parts, each of delta t, okay, the value of each part is just delta t, okay, the size of it, because this is just time that I'm modeling, right. So if you'll see this can be written as a sum of i goes from 1 to n epsilon i into root over delta t right that's what you can write it as because if you see my change in z in a small period of time was this okay 
and I want to model it over a longer period of time. So I have got n such uh, time periods, n parts I have divided it in and this change will be just uh, over this entire period of time it will be delta z i which can be written as summing over i goes from 1 to n epsilon i into root over delta t. Right, that's how you can model it. And now what is this? Now epsilon i, all of these have a normal distribution, right? So, uh, yeah, that is clear. And uh, delta t is just delta t, right? So, if you see what is the expectation of z t minus z 0, this can be written as the expectation of summing over i goes from 1 to n epsilon i into root over t okay and this will be equal to 0 because uh, you'll see the expectation of every epsilon i will be equal to 0 right what is the variance of uh, z t minus z 0 it will be equal to the variance of root over delta t this will come out summing over i goes from 1 to n epsilon i right that is what you will have okay now now what happens is uh, this delta t will come out so it just becomes uh, delta t right when it comes out of uh, the variance it gets squared and inside you just have got variance of summing over epsilon right so now if you'll see what is this this is just uh, the sum uh, variance of the sum of all of these epsilon can be written since they are all uh, independent it can be written as summing over the variance of epsilon and the variance of individual epsilon is just uh, one okay and it is added n times right so it just becomes n times delta t which is nothing but capital T so variance is just capital T and if you see what is the standard deviation your standard deviation for z t minus z 0 will be equal to root over t so again even over longer period of time your mean stays 0 your variance becomes capital T and your standard deviation is just the root of the time that you have spent okay so that is how this process operates so this process that we just discussed that I called as ZT here is denoted in your CM2 material by WT. Instead of ZT they have used WT and it is called as a Wiener process or a standard Brownian motion. Now what we had discussed just now is that we know that ZT minus Z0 has a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance as the time okay time lag between time t and time 0 in general for a uh, standard Brownian motion wt minus ws has a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance as the time lag t minus s which is very similar okay so that's your standard Brownian motion and it is called as standard Brownian motion because the uh, distribution in a unit time will be a standard normal distribution so w1 minus w0 will be normal 0 comma 1 in a unit time the distribution is standard uh, normal distribution okay we'll meet a more generalized form of uh, Brownian motion in the next section uh, as for the name of this Brownian motion this is named after uh, Robert Brown who was a botanist okay and he tried to model the particles of pollen pollen particles in water and he observed that they had this so sort of a zigzaggy movement okay that's why it's called as a Brownian motion now as for the properties of the Brownian motion this is often asked in the exam so you should know them w0 at time 0 is equal to 0 this is one thing you must know that is why here as well we had uh, z0 we assumed it to be 0 right so w0 at time 0 is always assumed to be 0 right Next thing is uh, WT has a continuous sample path. It has a continuous sample path. What does that mean? That it is a continuous time process. It keeps on going, okay? It just keeps on going. It moves like this, okay? And if you see the trend of this would be straight line because the expected value uh, is just zero, okay? So there is no change. Expected uh, value of this, the increments is zero. So it would just be a straight line, right? okay and uh, you can see that uh, 
you know the path is straight even for a stock uh, price we have discussed that we are considering that we are uh, noting the stock price or modeling the stock price in a continuous time okay so this is one thing that we know the next thing is increments wt minus ws have a normal 0 comma t minus s distribution this also we have discussed they are normally distributed increments this is the third property and the fourth property is just independent increments uh, this also implies that the process is a Markov process that because we know that any process having independent increments is a Markov process so if you have time going from 0 t1 t2 all the way up till tn then w t2 minus t1 before this you will have w t1 minus w0 then you will have w t3 minus t2 these are all increments of this process okay all the way up till w tn minus w tn minus 1 they are all independent random variables okay they have independent distributions and uh, if the time period, uh, the time lag is also the same, the distribution will become identical. So that's quite obvious. Okay. So those are the four properties that you have to remember. Continuous sample path, W0 is equal to 0. The increments are uh, normally distributed and they are independent. Okay. Now let's move on to the generalized Brownian motion. Now one important thing is here if you take expectation of WT minus WS, it will be equal to 0. Now, if I have used this process, this uh, standard Brownian motion to model the share price, I actually cannot because if you see, uh, let's say you have got your W uh, T process here and you have got time here, okay, on the X axis. Now, the value, the expected value at time T will be W T. Let's say expectation of W T is plotted here, okay. So, expected value at time T will be equal to W T, right, this value. And then the expected value at time s will be equal to ws. Okay, so this is your wt and this is your ws. And you can see that the expected difference between the two is equal to zero, which just means that I am expecting that the share price will not change between time t to s, which is an unrealistic expectation because we have already discussed that there is a usual growth trend in the stock prices, right? So there is a usual growth trend and around that there is some amount of volatility, right? So this will be inappropriate to model the stock prices. So what do we do? We instead of taking WT, we define a new process as ZT. Now what is ZT? ZT is basically mu times T, which denotes the general trend or it is called as the drift. We have already discussed this is called as the drift with time, the general trend with time. So it's just a straight line. Uh, trend which is denoted as mu t okay plus sigma times the brownian motion so sigma times the wiener wiener process so sigma times w t right and this is basically the volatility also there is one more component now we know that the value of uh, the Wiener process at time 0, W0 is always equal to 0. But with the share price that is not true, right? There is some starting value, okay? It can be anything. So the value at time 0 that we start with, wherever we are starting our uh, modeling, that is denoted as Z0. So this is your generalized Brownian motion, okay? Now, if you check the distribution of this, what will be the distribution? When you take the increment of this, ZT minus ZS, what will that be? ZT minus ZS can be written as mu T plus sigma times WT plus Z0 minus mu T plus sigma times WS plus z0 right that is what it will be this cancels out with this okay so what are you left with and uh, obviously this will be mu s sorry right so it just becomes mu t minus s plus sigma times w t minus w s 
and what will be the distribution of this if you see the distribution of this will be the distribution of w t minus w s is just normal 0 comma t minus s right when you multiply it with sigma this just becomes this part entire thing will become normal 0 comma sigma square times t minus s right that is what it will become and now you add mu t minus s to it so what does it become a constant is being added the variance won't change but the mean will change okay the mean changes with change in origin variance does not right so if constant is added then mean will change variance doesn't change so this becomes normal mu of t minus s mu into t minus s comma sigma square t minus s this is your distribution for the increment of a generalized Brownian motion with a drift coefficient of mu this is the drift coefficient and a variance coefficient or the volatility coefficient of sigma square okay so that is your uh, volatility coefficient that you are using right so that's your uh, you know generalized Brownian motion okay now let's discuss whether the generalized Brownian motion is an appropriate model for modeling the stock prices. So a generalized Brownian motion is given in this form. Zt is equal to Z0 plus mu t plus sigma wt. Right? This was our equation for the generalized Brownian motion. Now if you see what would be delta Zt, that is the change in Zt. This is a constant, won't change with time this would be mu times delta t right that would be your change plus sigma times what was the change in wt with time the change in wt with time was epsilon times root over delta t right so that would be your change in zt now if you talk about the expected change in zt the expected change in zt is just this part mu times delta t because the expectation of epsilon would be zero right so this entire part would be zero so this is your expected change in zt this just means that there is a constant change in the generalized brownian motion with time so there seems to be a linear trend in the price of the stock okay whether this is true let's talk about that okay for example basically the growth in stock prices reflects the expected returns by the investor so if a stock is priced at let's say rupees 100 and the investor is expecting 10 percent return in a year at the end of the year the stock will be priced at 110 okay because the expected return in the economy based on the inflation and other factors and uh, return on other securities would remain similar. Let's say 10 years later again the price of this stock becomes 1000 let's say randomly again the investor will expect 10% return in one year this time the return would be 100 so the stock at the end of the year would grow to 1100 in this case it would grow to 110 so although the percentage of return or the percentage of screen uh, increase is a constant the change in the stock price cannot be a constant with time it increases as the initial stock price or the year start stock price increases okay so that is how it works okay the increase is not constant when the price is higher the percentage change might be constant might be assumed to be constant over a long period but your uh, absolute amount of change in the stock price cannot be a constant so this model's actual uh, model actually fails now i'll try to find a model for the stock price so what is the model appropriate model for a stock price
So as we have seen the percentage or the proportionate change in the stock price, let's call it ST is a constant. So your delta ST by ST can be assumed to follow a generalized Brownian motion with a trend of muting. So let's equate this to this expression. So this is actually equal to mu times delta T plus sigma times epsilon times root over T. This ST here is called as a geometric Brownian motion. This ST is the geometric Brownian motion. which is used to model the stock prices. Okay, now let's try to get into the formal model of a geometric Brownian motion, which we will be using in our syllabus. So here, what we'll do basically is that instead of considering this delta T, which is the change in time, we'll consider DT, which is basically the change in time uh, in a very small period of time. Right, dt is basically the same as delta t when delta t tends to zero. So this we do in order to introduce the instantaneous rates of change, right? Change in a very small period of time or instants. That is a very popular concept in calculus, right? Once we do this, you realize that this just becomes dst over st is just equal to mu dt plus this en entire thing, epsilon times root over uh, delta t can be written as the change in wt, if you remember. We had written it earlier in this form, okay? Change in the standard Brownian motion. So this just becomes sigma times dwt. And this is the equation, this is the basically stochastic differential equation that represents that represents the geometric Brownian motion. And if you solve this stochastic differential equation, you will get that ST is equal to E to the power of ZT, where ZT is a standard Brownian motion and ZT minus ZS follows a normal distribution with the mean mu into T minus S and variance sigma square into t minus s, right? So your geometric Brownian motion, which is used to model the stock price is nothing but e to the power of zt. And you can see that this shows an exponential growth, right? This is a higher than linear growth. zt had a linear growth. So st has an exponential growth. And we know that the stock price growth is exponential because uh, the higher is the price, the higher is the growth, right? So it increases at an increasing rate. And that is why a geometric Brownian motion can be appropriately used to model it. Now, how to get from this dst by st to st is equal to e to the power of zt, okay? Or you can also write it as e to the power of mu t plus sigma times wt, where wt is a standard Brownian motion. This was our very, uh, very definition for ZT that I've just expanded here. This is a uh, generalized Brownian motion and WT here is a standard Brownian motion having a standard normal sort of a distribution in a unit time, right? So how do we get from here to here? It is a mathematical rigor which uh, requires stochastic, uh, dif uh, uh, stochastic calculus, which we'll do through Ito's lemma. There's a concept of Ito's lemma, which we'll understand, and then we'll be able to reach from this point to this point, okay? But the purpose of this vo video was to give you a broad framework of what we are trying to do here, okay? So I almost explain you what these things are and what we are trying to do. Now in the next video, I'll try to solve the mathematics and, uh, you know, try to reach from this point to this point. In the mean, uh, while I'll uh, introduce a certain properties relating to the Brownian motions, all three of them, 
the standardized one the generalized one and the geometric one right so we'll discuss different properties relating to them and uh, yeah that's what we'll do for now uh, this was your discussion uh, one or two more things i want to discuss here one thing is that you see that uh, zt minus zs that is the change in uh, zt has a normal distribution so if you take a uh, if you take this in the power of e e to the power of zt minus zs this will have a log normal distribution with mean mu times t minus s comma sigma square times t minus s because the exponential of the normal distribution has a log normal distribution if you remember from subject cs1 okay so that is what it will have a log normal distribution and uh, if you uh, see clearly you can actually write it in this way you can write it as e to the power of zt by e to the power of zs which will just be st by ss right this will have a log normal distribution okay the expectation of this will be the expectation of log uh, normal distribution needs to be applied here which is e to the power of mu plus half sigma square so it just becomes e to the power of mu t minus s plus half sigma square t minus s this will be your expectation and your variance of st by ss will be equal to e to the power of 2 mu t minus s minus sigma square t minus s multiplied with e to the power of sigma square into t minus s minus 1 right so these will be the mean and the variance of this distribution okay just remember that and apart from that rest of the things we discuss in the next video so thank you i just wanted to keep video short for now i made longer videos in the past but i think uh, shorter videos work better for you okay so yeah i'll i'll restrict most of my videos to half an hour okay all right thank you and if you want the full lectures of course you know the number the number is plus 9182903867678 and also if you have any doubts you can ping me that that also works even if you don't uh, buy my full lectures that's fine i am happy to help in any case any doubt relating to actual science or otherwise okay all right bye bye